I would like for you to imagine two pictures. Two pictures that show two different stages in a marriage. In picture number one, the husband and the wife are newlyweds. They are beaming with smiles. The joy is glowing in the background. They are very close with each other. There is something very bright, exciting and passionate about this first image. But in the second image, some years have gone by. This couple are still together, but they've grown distant. The gladness has been exchanged for sadness. It's somewhat of a dark picture. Now we can look at these two images and ask the question, what happened? In this imaginary scenario, we can see that this couple grew distant. The great love and passion they had for one another has been replaced by other things that have crept into their lives. And as a result, there is a distance that is formed. I wonder if you can relate to that when it comes to your Christian life. Are you feeling like your Christian life is a burden? Are you just getting by in your walk with the Lord? Does it feel like your service is only a duty and there is no delight in it at all? If you can relate to any of those questions, I want you to know that this message is for you. We're going to be hearing a word from the Lord Jesus Christ to a church that had grown cold. And he would have her reignite that flame of passion for him. But whether you identify with this or not, this message is for you. It is for all of God's people. For this letter ends with the words, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And what that teaches us is though this letter was written to a specific church, it is actually for all the churches to hear and to heed and by God's grace be built up and encouraged by the message that Jesus Christ has for his church. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, and my reading will be from verses 1 through to 7. We are working through the seven churches in the book of Revelation, found in Revelation 2 and 3. And today we begin with the very first letter. Let us hear the words of the living God, beginning in Revelation 2 and verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The message of this letter is Jesus is pleased when a church contends for the truth, but he hates it 
when a church loses its passionate love for him. That is the message of Jesus to the church in Ephesus. Now, I want to begin by showing you that this letter, like all of the letters in this section of Scripture, have a structure in common. And that is, we first of all learn about the church. We then receive a complement to that church with the exception of two of the letters. There is then a concern, and again, two of the letters have that as an exception, and then a counsel and then charge is given to this church. That is the structure that we see throughout these two chapters. I want to begin first of all by looking at this first feature of the letter, and that is the church. You'll notice the opening words, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write. This church was located in a city by the name of Ephesus. Ephesus was located in southwestern Asia Minor. It was a rather large city. It has been estimated that in the first century there were around a quarter of a million people populating this city. It was a busy city, a city that had an influential seaport and had a lot of trade and commerce going on. Uh, There were sporting games that were hosted by this city and it had also become a centre for religious practices. There was a temple for the goddess Diana or Artemis. And this particular temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. If you had a postcard of the city of Ephesus, I'm sure it consisted of much beauty and excitement. But it was here in this busy yet pagan city, a church, a church that was commended by the Lord Jesus Christ for doing many things that were truly pleasing to him. But there were also things about this church that were not pleasing to our Lord, and we'll consider these closely in just a moment. But how did this church begin in the city of Ephesus? As we go back to the book of Acts, we learn that this church came as a result of the missionary endeavors of the apostle Paul. In fact, Paul had spent three years of his ministry in this city working with the newly found Ephesian church. They would have been incredible days to have the Apostle Paul preaching publicly and from house to house ministering the word of God to this young yet growing church. We learn also that there were a number of influential individuals that had a part in the life of this Ephesian church. The founding pastor of this church was Timothy. And it's interesting that the letters to Timothy from Paul, 1st and 2nd Timothy, are surrounding events that are taking place in the Ephesian church. We also learn later on, according to history, that the Apostle John had an affiliation with the church in Ephesus. So to think that in in, in the early days you had someone like Paul and Timothy there, later on individuals like the Apostle John who ministered in this church, and as a result, a lot of the New Testament revolves around this particular church. You have a letter to the Ephesians, an entire book, six chapters, written by Paul. You have two pastoral letters written by Paul to Timothy, who was in Ephesus. You have John, who writes his three epistles, and it's possible that it is addressing matters concerning that particular church. And you even have this brief letter in Revelation 2, 1 to 7, to the Ephesian church. So the Ephesian church has a number of references in the New Testament. It was a significant church. But there are some things about this church, when Jesus looked into the life of it, that pleased him. We read at the beginning of verse 1, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Jesus identifies himself as the one who is active, the one who is at work in the church, the one who is burning with this glorious display of activity 
Then he reminds them, as he does every single one of these churches in verse 2, I know your works. Those words reveal the omniscience of Jesus Christ. Jesus knows everything. There is nothing hidden from him. There is no activity in a church that Jesus does not know about. He sees it all. He looks right through and he sees what is going on in terms of the public ministry of a church, but also the private ministry. He sees the good. He sees the bad. He sees it all. And as Jesus looks into the life of the Ephesian church, a church located in a pagan city, he begins with some compliments. There are things about this church that please him. What are these things? Well, I want you to notice what we read in verse 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. This church was working hard. They were laboring to the point of exhaustion in their service for the Lord Jesus Christ. They were a disciplined, committed, hard-working church for the sake of the gospel of Christ. They were busy, busy serving the Lord, committing themselves to enduring And in addition to this, we learn in verse 2 that they would not bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. They were not only a church filled with great duty in which they were serving the Lord with great commitment, but they were a church of great discernment in which they carefully examined the teachings of others. And they were recognizing the difference between truth and error. This church would not tolerate evil teaching. They would not tolerate the horrendous lies and distortions of Scripture from false teachers. Now, it's interesting that if you go back to Acts chapter 20, in Acts chapter 20, we come to the moment where Paul leaves Ephesus. He has just spent three years ministering the word of God there, faithfully proclaiming the full counsel of God day and night. And he's done this with tears. He has passionately served this people. And as Paul says farewell to the elders of the church in Ephesus, We read this instruction that Paul gave them in Acts 20, 28 to 30. Listen carefully to these words. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. The Apostle Paul warned the leaders of this church that you need to be on the lookout because there are going to be invaders in the church. There are going to be people who are going to come from the outside and they're going to attempt to bring false teaching into the life of the church and there will even be some from within the congregation that will rise up and will offer teachings that are twisted, unbiblical. Paul warned the elders that this is your duty to be on the lookout And it's interesting that a number of years has passed and as Jesus looks at this church, he commends this church for being a church that would not tolerate evil teachings, that would call out false teachers, a church that was discerning. Evidently, this church truly heeded the instructions of Paul that he gave to the Ephesian elders. This church has been committed to this. And what I want you to be reminded of at this particular point of the compliment that Jesus gives to this church is Jesus is always pleased 
when his people reject error. I know that we live in a time where we're constantly told that we need to be tolerant. We need to be accepting of everybody. We need to be accepting of different teachings. And these ideas are bombarding the church. But let's make it very clear in our minds that this church in Ephesus made it their commitment to call out error, to fight against evil, and to oppose anybody who did not teach the word of God in all its fullness. And when that church did that, Jesus looks at that church and says, I am pleased with that. We as the people of God are to contend for the truth. This pleases our Lord. And we would do well to note this compliment. But Jesus goes on to say in verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. You see, it's a tough thing standing for truth. It can bring us down. It is a burden to carry. But this church was committed. It was a heavy burden to fight for the truth. It was hard. It was difficult. It was a narrow pathway to go down. But they were willing to go down that pathway and they patiently endured. And the Lord sees it. He sees it that when we are being faithful to him, and striving to continue to go down the pathway he calls for us to go down for the sake of his truth, he is pleased by that. So the first thing I want you to see after we are introduced to the church itself is our Lord issues a compliment to this church. He looks at the Ephesian church and says, you are an active church, disciplined, serving, faithful, calling out error, opposing those who will not teach the truth of the word. And you are enduring this patiently and you are continuing to go on and on and on for the sake of truth. The Lord was pleased by this. But then we come to verse four. And what we have in verse four is the concern. The first six words of verse four are the most chilling words any Christian would ever hear. After Jesus takes time to commend this church for their active service and their willingness to contend for the truth, Jesus says in verse four, but I have this against you. Did you hear those words? They're coming from the Lord Jesus. He looks into this faithful, disciplined, doctrinally sound church, and he says, but I have this against you. What sadness should fill us to think that there is something that Jesus can see in our church that he would say, I am not pleased by this. In fact, he hates this. What is it that this discipline, doctrinally sound church was doing that resulted in Jesus saying, I've got something against you. Have a look at verse 4. You have abandoned the love you had at first. They've abandoned their first love. He didn't say that you no longer love. He didn't say you're a church without love. But he said you have abandoned your first love. What is he referring to here? I think it's helpful to understand the significance of this if we were to go back to the early days of this church. Back in Acts chapter 19, when Paul was in Ephesus and preached the word of God and 
incredible activities were happening as a result of his apostolic ministry. The Lord did a sovereign, incredible, saving work in which many individuals went from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. People were being converted. And it's interesting that we are told that you had a group of these new converts in Ephesus take a lot of the objects and books that they used to have as a part of their life of the occult, practices of magic, and they took it all and they burnt it. And we are told that this was worth 50 pieces of silver. This was a significant amount of items that were burnt up and abandoned because they had this burning, passionate devotion to Jesus Christ. They were enthusiastic for Christ. As one preacher said, they had hot hearts for the Lord Jesus Christ. This church in its early days was on fire. They were on fire for their Lord Jesus Christ. They were affectionate for him. They loved their Lord. They were devoted to him. They saw the sweetness of their Savior. They saw that only he could satisfy. And they were prepared to abandon their old practices and to commit themselves to the public ministry of serving Jesus Christ and to do this in their church as well. This church was on fire. But evidently, over the course of time, this church was still committed to the charge of being disciplined, of being doctrinally pure, and of being discerning. But that passion that they had for the Lord Jesus was beginning to diminish. And it has come to the point in which this church that was once hot is now cold. Sure, they're busy. There's plenty of items on their bulletin. Their website is probably filled with active ministries. But Jesus cuts through it all and he looks into the deep recesses of this church and says, I look past what you write on your bulletin. I look past what's on your website and I see a church that has become cold. There is lots of duty, but there's no delight. Jesus looks at this church and criticizes this church for abandoning their first love. It's amazing how we can very quickly replace our passionate understanding of the Lord with various things, various pursuits, and before we know it, we begin to take our eyes off him and the routines of ministry may continue for a while, but eventually, if that is not being fueled by a passion of Jesus, we are opening a door for compromise. And when compromise invades the church, sin spreads and it begins to strangle the life and and the activity of that congregation, and if it continues to get to a far extent of such compromise, the Lord will spew it out of his mouth, as he says to the church in Laodicea, you're neither cold nor hot. You see, they've gone to the end of this line of compromise. Jesus writes to this church and says, I see your duty. I see your discipline. I see your discernment. I see your doctrinal purity. But what I don't see is a passion for me. You've abandoned that love that you had in those early days. This brings me to the next component of the letter, and it's found in verses 5 and 6, and this is the Lord's counsel to this church. What would Jesus say to a Christian who says that I'm serving, but I'm feeling that it's somewhat of a burden. I'm in the church, but I'm just getting by. I have lots of duty, but there is no delight. What is the counsel of Jesus to such a person? Jesus issues a threefold strategy in verses 5 and 6. He tells them to remember, to repent, 
and to return. Let's have a look at the first one. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. The solution to their problem is not to just keep on going with more and more and more duty. The Lord says to them, I want you to remember. I want you to go back to the past and I want you to remember what it was like in those early days. I want you to remember those days in Ephesus when you took all those arts from your past and you threw them on the ground and you burnt them up for me. I want you to remember those times that you were among God's people and you were loving them, you were serving them, you were giving sacrificially. I want you to remember those times that you gathered with God's people and you didn't want to go home. You loved gathering in the morning service, in the evening service, in the Bible studies. You couldn't have enough of the life of the church because you loved me and you loved my people. I want you to remember those days. Remember the passion for me that fueled your living. Now to go back and remember that first love brings us to the object of the love. Why did they have such a passionate love? Because it was directed toward the sweetness and kindness of their Saviour. The instruction of Jesus for them to remember from where they've fallen is to go back to the object of their affection, to go back to Christ. If we are growing cold, stale, if we are seeing the sadness of an abandonment, of our first love for Christ, then we would do well to remember those days we passionately served him by looking intently at the beauty of Jesus Christ. We have a glorious Savior. Think upon his righteousness. Jesus is without sin and he lived a perfect righteous life on your behalf. Think of his redemption. You and I deserved the just wrath of God, but Jesus redeemed us at the cross by dying as a substitute for sinners. Think of his resurrection, that death could not hold him down, but he is alive. Think of the fact that he is ruling from the right hand of the throne of God and he will return one day and he will right every wrong. He will rule and reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Remember the sweetness of your Saviour. Remember his words. Remember his works. If we are going to return to this passionate love for Jesus Christ, we would do well to remember that great love that we once had. Jesus then says, once you remember, you are to then repent. The word repent involves the idea of a complete change. To repent means to recognize that I have done the wrong thing. I am repulsed by my sin and I now return to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what repentance is. Repentance is to agree with God concerning his assessment of our sin and to turn from it. And then he says, and then you are to do the works that you did at first. In other words, return, go back to serving me, being discerning for me, having doctrinal purity for me out of a passionate love for me, not out of routine, but out of a love for our Redeemer. But Jesus also issues a very serious warning. He says, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus threatens this church with judgment. Now, what this tells us, first of all, is this. Our Lord Jesus Christ takes it very seriously when we do not have a passionate love for him. This is the first great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. When we take that flippantly, when we are neglecting the commitment to devote ourselves to the love of God, Jesus will act. And he says to this church, I will intervene. I will remove your lampstand from its place. I will shut this church down. 
you will no longer be a bright shining witness for me. This is a very serious point that our Lord is making. But it's interesting that he goes on to say in verse 6, yet this you have. They weren't without hope. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So even though this congregation was moving away from a passionate love for Christ, Christ did still see their doctrinal purity, and he calls for them to remember, to repent, and to return. We now come to the charge, and that is found in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, the opening words of verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, tells us that this letter was not just intended for the church in Ephesus. It was intended for all the churches. So all of us will do well to read this letter and to heed the message of this letter. But notice the beautiful charge that Christ gives to the one who conquers. Remember, the one who conquers, according to 1 John 5, verses 3 to 4, is every born-again believer. It is those who have received a new heart, those who love the Lord. They are the ones who overcome or conquer. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The tree of life was first referenced back in Genesis chapter 2. And here it's referenced again, and we'll see it later on in the book of Revelation at the end of this book. Uh, This tree here is symbolizing or representing the gift of eternal life. And Jesus here is saying to this church that for all those who are truly mine, to those who are overcomers, to those who are born again, you will be granted access to the glorious paradise of God, the kingdom of heaven, the glorious garden, And there you will have eternal life. He is reminding this church of the promise that God's people will experience eternal life. Now, as I bring this message to a close, I don't want us to simply look at a letter like this and read the fact that here was a church and there were some things about it that Jesus was pleased with. There were some things about it that he was displeased with. And we move on to the very next letter. This letter was for the church in Ephesus, but it's also for you and me. The question that you and I need to ask is this. As Jesus looks into your life as a Christian, does he see a Christian life that is disciplined, that is doctrinally pure, and that is discerning? Because that pleases him. He is delighted in that. And if we are pursuing such things, we are glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, we need to ask ourselves this. Am I passionately loving my Savior? Am I delighting in his sweetness, in his sovereignty? Do I love the Lord Jesus Christ? If that passionate, heartfelt desire for him is dissipating or disappearing, you need to remember, repent and return. Our Lord desires this. He demands this of his people. We would do well to have what we could call memorial stones in our lives as Christians. Because we can easily forget the great blessings that God has granted us. You remember in the book of Joshua, chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, Joshua, the commander of the Lord's army, was to lead the people into the promised land by crossing through the Jordan River. The Lord had miraculously parted the waters and allowed the children of Israel to walk on dry ground through the Jordan into the land of promise. 
But the Lord instructed Joshua to select 12 men from the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were to pick up a stone from the Jordan. They were to carry it on their shoulders and they were then to set them down. And they were to be a memorial, a reminder that God had delivered them. That God had opened up the waters and God had brought them into the land of promise. To think that as the children of Israel would go about their routines in life, as they were getting busy, as they were getting distracted, every time they look at those stones, they would be reminded, God is good. He brought us into this land. He fulfilled his promise to Abraham. He cared for us. He loved us. And he has provided for us. We need to have memorial stones in our lives so that we would constantly be reminded of our great and glorious Saviour and serve him with all our heart. May the Lord give us help to do this. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this letter to the church in Ephesus. I pray that you would help us to take time to remember your goodness and kindness toward us. Help us to be a faithful people who are devoted, who are discerning, and who are doctrinally pure. But help us to be committed to our passionate love for you. Help us to serve you and to do this from a burning heart of gratefulness of all that you have done for, for us. Help us by the help of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen.